Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe Jesus is worth your sacrifice? Submitting to God's plan requires sacrifice. Jesus asked us to give our whole lives to follow after him. Let's hear a few more words about following after him. Bobby Wilson, right? Yes, may I help you? Might not want to. I'm the attorney for Lauren Carson, the widow of Ron Carson. Can I ask you a question? Anything I can do to stop you? In a few minutes, you're gonna go in there. The union, the department, the city, and the county are gonna look to hang you. And you're gonna let them do it. It's about the size of it. And after that, I am gonna take you for everything you own. And you're still gonna go through with it. Yes. Why? I was once asked if you were ever accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I don't know. Maybe. But if what I did has suddenly become a crime, then I'm proud to plead guilty. I shared my faith with a dying man. It's something I've done for years, only no one's ever cared about it until now. Times change. People who are smart change with them. I didn't fail your client's husband. Medically speaking, I did everything I could. I did my job. Off the record, I don't really care. Then why? For me, it's about money. For my client, it's about hurting you. And for all of us, including the city, it's about stopping people like you from pushing their beliefs on others. I don't expect you to understand that. There's one thing that you should know if you don't already. This cross, it's gonna cost you. Told you. Our spiritual 
yourselves, lose our connection with God, lose the eternal future that God has offered us. Now later in the service, each of you or at least those who are adults are going to be offered a cross. And, and it's not anything special, it's just a little wooden cross that a friend of mine made for us because when we looked online, they wanted too much money for it. But these crosses are symbolic of the cross that was in the movie there where the lawyer said to her when she when she held up uh, that cross to the EMT, she said, this cross, it's going to cost you. Does the cross you bear, does the cross I bear every day, does it cost me? Or is it just something that I conveniently pick up and lay down when it's convenient? What kind of risk would you take? What kind of risk would I be willing to take to share our faith with a co-worker, with a neighbor, or with a stranger? Now think about that. Would you be willing to share your faith with a co-worker? I didn't say coming there as a Bible-thumping person beating them over the head like they used to do in some other situations. I said, would an opportunity occur, and they always do. When someone is struggling with a question, would you be willing to offer an answer from your biblical, spiritual perspective? Would you be willing to, to lead, reach out to a neighbor and to share love and hope, and not just in a generic fashion? Now, I'm going to tell you, we've lived in Elmwood almost two years now, and I have at least one neighbor that yesterday was the first time we actually talked. We waved and we've gone by and it's been safe. It's kind of like, you know, keep the preacher at bay thing. <laughs> you know, you, you don't really want him to get in your business or your life. But, but I was cutting the grass and he was working on his garage and he actually talked to me. Debbie heard it out the back window and she was like, I couldn't believe it. We had a conversation. But now the next step is on my part. Will I move past that comfort zone, which is pretty narrow, and be willing to, say, invite his kids to come and vacation Bible school? Will I be willing to invite his significant other to come with us to our couples fellowship with him? Will I be willing to engage in wherever his life is and offer hope and joy. Not judgment, not an attitude of I got this right and you got this wrong, but how comfortable are we, or I should say how uncomfortable are we willing to be with those around us? Earlier in my life I had a chance to do some street ministry with a group called No Greater Love Ministry during the Mardi Gras, right before Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And it was before Katrina, so New Orleans was bustling and teeming, and, and we as groups would stand on street corners as part of the ministry, not the whole thing, and actually preach outdoors. Now, somebody said to me, Brad, don't you think it's something unseemly and, and uh, unconventional and just totally unspiritual about preaching to people who didn't bother to come through the doors of your church, I'm going to tell you, it was straight up scary. Because you knew that most of those people didn't want to hear what you had to say. And it was really kind of fun after we got to doing it, Tom, because, you know, you didn't care if they cared. You just start preaching the word of God. And you read a scripture, and there were three other guys at different points around you, one to be praying for you, and two of them New Orleans to make sure nobody was coming up behind you. <laughs> but, but it was an awakening experience to actually share the word of God with a total stranger who had not bothered to come through the doors of a church or meet me at a Bible study. Again, a lot of people's jobs prohibit any expression of religion on their job. In our society, you hear on the radio all the time, and I actually read articles where in this day of 
folks, 911 people want to make sure there are not fanatics around in the place. And so how can you show your faith but yet not infringe on another's rights to either have or not have a faith? Those are fine lines and it seems like they're always moving back and forth. But yet I believe, as our theme says, do you believe that we are called to test those lines and to be open to them moving. Do you believe Jesus is worth the sacrifice? Again, God is faithful in our sacrifice. And that word sacrifice is used not too often in our daily language because in America, we're not about sacrifice, we're about getting ours. We're about moving ahead on our jobs. We're about building bigger buildings. We're about seeing how many more people we can encounter. We're about looking at our bank accounts or our status in a social setting. Sacrifice, giving up for someone else, doing something and, and allowing yourself to maybe even experience something unpleasant for someone else. Uh, let's look at Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 32. And we see that when you begin there, it says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to, to insult and persecution, at other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Now, who really does that? But we'll come back to that. Because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not roll away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what God has promised. Persevere. I'm trying to think about how happily I could be in life if every time I said, you know, I believe in Jesus, somebody took a dollar out of my account. I'm trying to imagine being content in a world where your faith might actually put your life at risk. There are people like that in other places, not here, but in other places. There are people who feel like that. They are in danger of social isolation if they express their faith. It's not as bad or as traumatic as the EMT losing his job and and possibly losing his home and his life savings, but it's still scary. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is worth the sacrifice? It has been written, when sacrifice turns to suffering, it's hard to understand how someone could make the choice to willingly walk into hardship. How could we willingly make the choice to walk into hardship? When I think about that, I'm, I'm trying to envision walking into a setting where things are very uncomfortable for those who are outside the norm, not being included in a social grouping because you not only believe, but you express a faith that is living in not just an intellectual pursuit or something that is confined to the walls of this building. I'm trying to imagine. When I do, a story comes to mind that someone else told. In this story, this, this person uh, kind of compared their faith to a car. Now, imagine that you have a well-worn vehicle, something that has served you well for years, but it's not working too well anymore. But yet it has a special meaning to you or to others in your family because it's seen you through some tough times. It's been there for you when it seems like other people have not been there for you, but this vehicle has. And if someone 
someone comes to you and they offer you the opportunity to, to get your dream car, your dream truck, you know it's all tricked out with all the tires and the mufflers and all that chrome and stuff. It has the best sound system in the world. You know, people can hear it three blocks away. You can get this for free. But there's only one catch. Oh, maybe two. The first catch is you have to be willing to lay your hands on that vehicle and keep at least one hand on that vehicle for three straight days. You can't go anywhere. You can't go to the bathroom. You can't go into the house. You have to stand out in the heat and the rain or maybe the cold and the snow for three straight days. Would you do it? Could you? And then let's imagine that you do it and you're about to get this dream vehicle given to you. No strings attached. All the title and plates and licenses have been paid for and it's yours. But the last catch is you've got to give away that old vehicle that you had, that well-worn vehicle, that vehicle that you might have had some fun in when you were a teenager or that your children were driven back and forth to school in or that you and your significant other had some arguments in and came to reconcile those arguments in the back seat maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but you have to give away that vehicle to get the new one. The dream. Would you do it? Could you do it? That is what sacrifice can represent for us in the 21st century where we want it all. We want to be able to keep our old faith and our old religion. We want to be able to keep our old traditions. We want to be able to keep all of our old clothes and add new clothes to them. We want to keep our old vehicle and add new vehicles to them. But we can keep everything. Some things we have to give away to somebody else. We're not just getting rid of them, we're passing them on. That's what sacrifice is about in the 21st century, I believe. I believe that this morning you and I have been called to struggle with what is it we're willing to part with so that we can receive the hope and the joy and the peace and the salvation and all that good stuff that Jesus has for us. We've got to let go of some of the things that the world might say is good. We have to be willing to maybe not get as much acclaim as we might have gotten. We might be willing to give up some of our time. That's real precious in today's culture, time. We might restructure our lives so that God is at the center. We might refocus our family so that not just coming to church, but participating in spiritual enrichment, Sunday school, youth group, fellowship groups, Bible studies would become a regular part of our lives. But for any of that to happen in today's culture, in the 21st century, in Elmwood, Farmington, Yates City, Peoria, wherever, we have to be willing to take our hands off of something old so that we can claim something new. What will you let go? Because if you're not willing to let anything go, you can't receive the new gift that Jesus has for you when you pick up this little bitty wood cross that's not worth a lot of money but represents a lot of hope. I'm reminded of a story in uh, the book of Daniel. In a case you don't know what that is, I'm going to put this out here three months in advance. Bible study starting up in the middle of August. They will help you find those. Disciple Bible study one and, and time maybe somebody will continue. I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus. Disciple two uh, Bible study. And then there will be some short term studies because remember, I hope you remember when I first came I said I knew we would come from different perspectives in life that Debbie and I look a little bit different than most of you here today. And that we brought different baggage to the table. But when we opened up our individual baggage, that we would be able to move forward because we would use the same language. 
And that language is Bible. But you can't use a language you've never been exposed to. You can't use a language you've never struggled with. You've never been in community with other people with. So I'm going to invite you to, again, prayerfully consider how you're going to let go of something else so that you can take on a Bible study or a small group or a Sunday school class. Something so that we can all speak the same language. But in speaking that language today, the book of Daniel and the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures, chapter 3 reminds me of a story. And in this story, there was these three guys. And I'm going to paraphrase it. Some of you know that I like to use the Brad Watkins version. And so in the Brad Watkins version of Daniel 3, 1 through 30, there's these three guys that the book of, of, of Daniel says were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, when I was a kid, I always thought that was a Bendigo, baby, but it's a Bendigo. And, and, and these three guys were Jewish persons who were living in captivity in Babylon, but yet they were persons who had influence and persons of authority. And so when uh, the emperor of Babylon recalled everyone together, and King, King Nebuchadnezzar said, everybody's got to bow to this golden god that I've built now, and, and you'll be good if you do that, but if you don't bow to the golden uh, idol that I built, you're going to die instantly. You're going to suffer. <laughs> Your family's going to suffer. And again, these three guys, after a long story here now, I'm going to advise you. I'm going to advise you. Read the whole story for yourself, because there's a lot of good stuff in there. But to make a long story short, these three guys say, no, we ain't going to do that, King. Can't do it. Our faith, our religion, our, our spiritual reality will not allow us to do that. So the king has them tied up. And, and when I was a kid, I just heard about them being thrown into the fire of the furnace and, and how they weren't harmed. Now, the book reminds us that they just didn't get thrown up, thrown in there, that there were guards who threw them in the furnace and those guards were killed instantly, burned, incinerated, however you want to put it. But yet, when the king looked into the furnace, he saw that there were four figures that were unharmed, walking around, unbound. And when they came out, the king said to everybody, we got to worship the God of these Hebrews, of these Jewish persons, because that God was with them in that fiery furnace that, that it wasn't just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but there was some other figure in there with them. And so we would like to say it's an angel, a God who not only protected them, but walked with them. And when they came out, they said, you know, even if we had not been saved, we still would have held on to our faith. Could you and I say that? Would we have even chanced? Would we have just bowed to the gods of the golden calves of our day and age and said, it's only for a little while. Save ourselves first. Do you believe that the cross of Jesus Christ is worth the sacrifice? I'm going to ask the ushers to pass out uh, these little crosses at this time. And as I think about it, and as I invite you to grab hold of it, to struggle for yourself, what does the cross of Christ mean for me? The author of our study reminds us that choosing to completely surrender, go ahead and pass out the cross. <laughs> choosing to completely surrender to God's plan may mean great sacrifice. Great sacrifice. What does that mean for you? Each and every one of, one of us has a different assessment of sacrifice. Some of us is sacrificed possibly in finances. Some of us is sacrificed maybe in relationships. Some of us, it might be sacrificed in who we choose to socialize with or hang around with. Some of us, it might be sacrificing what we take on and not just what we give up. That's what I love about this sacrifice thing. It, it goes and it kind of changes with the person, but yet the bottom line is, is that Jesus sacrificed for our salvation, for our healing, for our wholeness in this life and in the next life. It's not just about that eternity by and by, by and side stuff. It's about right now. 
Jesus sacrifice. And he asks us to sacrifice for others. Remember, sacrifice is not sacrifice if it's just for me. But when it does something for others, when it witnesses for others, when it helps others, when it inspires others, when it uplifts others, and when it nurtures and comforts others, that's sacrifice. The sacrifice may cost us everything, but God promises to remain faithful to us always. Is Jesus worth your sacrifice and my sacrifice? Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, again, I just struggle this morning. I'm struggling to, to see how you can help me to, to grab hold of that new shiny vehicle that you offer me, that new hope, and let go of the things that would hold me back, even though some of them are cherished. Some of them have good memories, but they're not helping me right now, Lord. This morning, Lord, I that you would stir not only my heart, but that you would touch all those who were civil here today and all those who may hear you at a different time to know and to ask the question, what will I sacrifice? Because Jesus sacrificed for me. In his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite our worship band back up as we prepare to Continue to move forward. Now, remember these crosses are for you to take home, which you put at your desk, put in your glove compartment, put it somewhere where you actually look at it every once in a while because they invite you into missional activity, service to others, like the Habitat lesson yesterday, where the big hole is now, but hopefully some of us will join together to make it something much more than a big hole here in town for the homes for heroes. It will be a home for a family who has served us and who is currently serving us. Whatever your sacrifice is, I'm glad that we're given the possibility to give back, not only for ourselves, but for others. Will the ushers come forward?
prepared to decide how you're going to not turn that. back, but <laughs> turn toward Jesus. You're going to take these little wooden crosses out into the world in your lives and share with a dying world a hope for eternal life. Go forth with peace. Go forth with grace. Amen. Amen. Amen.